So without further ado, I will hand the microphone over to Mrs. Akuta, who will share with us another side of WW2. I think it's still good morning time, so I say good morning. And, you know, of course that's Ohio. Uh, I want to thank this congregation for inviting me. Um, I really hadn't covered this subject before directly, so I don't know how it's going to turn out. But basically, I want to talk about war time in Japan. And I'm scared stiff right now because how Japan went into the war it's very similar to what's happening since 9-11, and I'll go into the detail about that. Um, as you know, Japan was isolated for 200 years or so and became very feudalistic and a very centralized political system I'm sure you remember Shogun book and movie. Um, so basically there is one train of thoughts that is very much like Shogun, the head, and also women don't count. Men have the power. Um, also this lineage of imperial family above everybody and emperor being considered direct son of God, son God Amaterasu. So emperor, in, in my case it's emperor Hirohito, now it's uh, different, but he was considered God that means you don't question authority. And looking back, actually, he was used by political powers to be. But that's not how he was presented at that time. So keeping that in mind, I like to kind of trace how white wing religion is behind the war mentality. Does this sound sort of familiar? Yes. Especially after seeing that uh, documentary on the front line on the PBS with uh, George Bush saying how he was converted to religion. I see some uh, earmarks that we need to watch. So I like to, having said that, I like to contrast how things were before the World War II and how horrible it turned out to be. So there's basically chapter one and chapter two. The chapter one part uh, I'd like to just give you a very quick family history. Um, I'm a mixed up kid. I mean, everybody who <laughs> knows me from a long time ago when I was in and out of this wonderful church would know that I was a mixed up kid. And uh, the reason is, my, it's my parents' fault, you know. <laughs> Because my father came from lineage of imperial family connection. And he was the youngest of eight children. So he didn't develop his own personality very much. He was kind of uh, pushed around by very verbal, strong, older siblings. And again, one of the feudalistic idea is respect your elders. So he didn't have much to say. So 
my brother's, my father's sister ended up serving in imperial household as a head housekeeper and interior decorator. So she had a very high status job, but she was totally immersed in protocols, traditions, and a philosophy of imperial feudalistic thing. My grandfather, that's my father's father, I guess wasn't a very wealthy person to begin with, but he was a very ambitious person. And uh, in order to get education, he got himself adopted to a Shinto leader's family, high priest's family. Because most of the days, the public schools were not readily available over, you know, fourth grade or so. So he became a very well-educated man, ended up being an architect, and um, many other things. If you uh, have gone to some of the temples in Kyoto, there are some floors that squeaks, and it sounds like a bird. It's very artistic, and they call it nightingale floor. But the real idea is there are so many intrigues that even the people who slept in a temple, especially they were high-ranking warlord who was exiled in political intrigues, sort of like, you know, Henry VIII in England was doing pretty strange things. Japan had a few of those. Uh, you know, skeleton in closet, and they stayed in those gorgeous, beautiful temples. But they had to sleep with one eye open in case assassin will come and sneak up and cut his head. So they installed this nightingale floor. So you couldn't sneak up without waking him up. When he hears the birds two o'clock in the morning, he knows he better <laughs> grab his own sword and take care of uh, emergency. And my grandfather was uh, in charge of squeaky floor, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. Actually, he was in charge of anything that went wrong with imperial buildings. Sometimes when the rain was heavy and the roof leaked or something, he had to dash out. So anyhow, that's my father's side. And uh, therefore, I was uh, allowed to go to uh, imperial household to visit my aunt. On the other side, my mother's side is much more westernized. My uncle, for instance, studied composition and conducting classical music in Bonn, Germany. So sometimes he forgot Japanese and he would mumble something in German and we say, hey, talking Japanese. <laughs> um, my aunt, who is my mother's younger sister, managed to learn English well enough to work for an export company. So she was typing, you know, royal, uh, some typewriter in those days. And she used all American cosmetics. And, you know, I used to be so fascinated by the way she was applying different foundations and rules. And, <laughs> and uh, it was a very genteel family. My grandfather um, was interested in music education. And somehow, he managed to get himself into sort of like Ministry of Education. I'm talking about before the turn of the century. So he was commissioned to adapt Western music, tunes, and American tunes, and to make children's songs 
and put Japanese words to it. So this is why if you look at the Suzuki piano book or violin book of your grandchildren, there are a lot of Japanese music, but it sounds American because they started with American music. So he, his job was very westernized. Therefore, I still remember we had tea time, high tea, British high tea, three o'clock in the afternoon, everybody comes, we drink Lipton tea. <laughs> And cookies like what we have over here. And uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, this uh, westernized musician, was also interested in oil painting. So they had a pretty big garden. Sometimes they have oil painting party. They hire a model. Not totally nude, Japanese don't do that, <laughs> but a um, beautiful woman in Western light clothes, pose, and three, four people set up easels and critique each other as they paint. And when I go to a Cleveland Museum of Art and see, I think it's uh, Cezanne or somebody has a uh, painting of a garden painting scene. I always think of my grandfather's painting party. And also he taught music instrument in his own house. And that's all um, Beethoven, you know, things that you're familiar with. So, how did uh, my parents meet and marry? My father, getting back to my father's side, even if they are so traditional, right-wing, Japanese, imperial, he was so cute and so well-behaved, he was chosen to be an official playmate for Emperor's cousin. We call, it Kayano, call him Kayanomiya. So, he didn't have time to study. In Japan, if you don't study very hard, you cannot get into public schools because public schools have more demanding educational level. So he ended up going to Doshisha campus. And Doshisha is a big, sort of like East Western Reserve, starting with the kindergarten skip elementary school, and then junior high school, they call it middle school, and so on and so forth. So he ended up going to Doshisha, because it's easier to get in, so he went to Doshisha middle school. And many of our students from Doshisha came to my maternal grandfather's house to practice musical instrument, talk politics, was like a democracy was tossed around, even a socialism was tossed around very freely. And I was only, uh, you know, kindergarten age, so I was just roaming around listening to snippet of those stories. So that's the uh, kind of mood, and we called it batakusai, butter, you know. Kusai means smell. So when people want to criticize families that's too Americanized or Westernized, they call it, that family smells like butter. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely my maternal side was smell like butter family. And they do, did use a lot of butter. My uh, grandmother on the maternal side ended up ended up with a stroke. Maybe she used too much butter. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that was pretty progressive, so-called democratic, and the women were treated very well. Well, of course, my grandfather, poor man, didn't have a choice. There were four girls, no boys. So maybe that's 
So he lived in a female-dominated family, a very strong-willed wife, and four daughters. Um, as you recall, Japan became militaristic and won the war against Russia. And then in 1920, Japan won the war against China. Japan developed a taste for colonialism and uh, did all the bad things that any colonizing nations like Spain, England, France, even USA do, like forbidding the language of the original uh, language of a country like Korea, take over Korea, force them to speak in Japanese, and force them to go to Japanese language school. Uh, in fact, my paternal side, my uh, uncle, a sort of uh, uncle by marriage, was sent to Taiwan to colonize Taiwan, and his job was to rewrite constitution to suit Japanese imperial colonialism. How do you like that? So I, if I have to go through war criminal thing, I might be on the fringe of the guilty party by association, not by doing it. Uh, maybe you read about coup d'etat that happened in 1936. After the Japan got taste of colonialism, and the Japanese economy got so big, there was a market competition between the United States and Japan. And the U.S. was not going to let the Japanese roam around and make inconvenience for American colonialism. Remember, America had enough colonialism going by that time. Almost all Central America and the Caribbean islands and the Philippines were under influence of American imperialism anyway. So there was a clash of two imperialism. And Japan has no natural resources, as you know, so they have to go to Indochina and get the rubber, metal, brokisides to make aluminum and stuff like that. So that was sort of if I was uh, I wear economist hat, I would say that was inevitable. As a peace activist, I say that's just terrible. There was a coup d'etat. Uh, even the uh, prime minister and uh, many cabinet people were assassinated, and the right wing military took over the country. And I kind of joked about French fries and freedom fries. But actually it freaked me out because that's what the Stojo government, that's the uh, right wing military com counterpart of Hitler, forbade us to use English words. Couldn't say donuts, because that's America. We couldn't say rain shoes. We had to say amegutsu, that means ame, as you know, is rain. Kutsu is shoes. Amegutsu makes it rain shoes. For some of you who studied the Japanese, you can recognize kutsu and ame. Elevator, well, the Japanese never can speak right, so elevator was corrupted into elevator. Couldn't say that. We have to say a machine that goes up and down. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the Britishers, they call it left. So maybe that's closer to British <laughs> translation. But just imagine how devastating it was for my grandmother's side. Uncle, who was very successful as a conductor, conducting major symphonies all over Japan, 
lost a job because they no longer played Western music. Everybody had to go back to Koto and the Shamisen. And I was forced to study flower arrangement. Um, women were told not to wear American clothes, style clothes, and wear traditional kimono because it's more patriotic. Remember that word, patriotic? Anything that you don't agree with the Tojo is unpatriotic. Does it sound sort of familiar? Yes. Um, and another thing I think I started out saying is that watch out for right-wing religion. Actually, there's a gentleman called uh, John Deering. He lives in Lorraine, Ohio. He wrote a book called Is God Man or Woman? He concluded that right-wing religion is a basic ingredient in organizing the country to go into war and stay in the war. And he listed many examples from different parts of the world at a different time. But just stop and think. Usually, we end up going into the war for God's sake, not people's sake. And I'm not saying that all the religion is bad, but those people in power seem to know how to use religion and the mysteriousness and the illogicalness part of religion to unite the people to go into war. That's exactly what Tojo did. There is a Shinto temple, there are the shrines and Buddhist temple, and Japanese just use that as a natural process, just like Americans, I'm talking about non-church-going Americans now, not good people like you, but you know, we still use church for funeral and wedding and, you know, somehow civil wedding is not good enough. You know, it's kind of second way. We have to go to the uh, church to do the real and um, good and the proper. So Japan used Shinto for funerals, I mean, yeah, the uh, birth and weddings and Buddhism for funerals, and that took care of it very nicely. But all of a sudden, Shinto is the religion because that's where the emperor comes from. And because resources were being used for military, our uh, consumer goods became more and more difficult to get. So there was a ration. I know you people had a ration too, so I'm not saying Japan had a, the, it was the only one. But Japanese ration was much more severe. And um, there wasn't enough rice. So people in the city that didn't have access to food had to take kimono like this, kind of ornate kimono like this, and the butter and give it to the farmers. The farmers will give us rice. And uh, my family, said, uh, well, it's about time to get out of Tokyo. The uh, many soldiers were coming back in a little square box. In this country, soldiers come home in a big casket draped with star and stripe. In Japan, they cremate them and bring it back in a small box. We, uh, the family decided to move to a very nice resort place, which was built on my paternal side, grandfather, who was an architect, that impeccably designed, beautiful, convenient, efficient place overlooking the lake. 
and not lakes, Pacific Ocean. Uh, it was this fantastic view. So we are very fortunate. At least we had a nice view, nice house. My cousins in Tokyo were not that fortunate. Just like British people, children were sent away to strangers' homes in rural area. In my aunt's case, they had to go to Hokkaido, which is very cold, worse than Cleveland. <laughs> and they were not used to that kind of weather. They didn't even own warm clothes because you don't need them in Japan. Tokyo, you know, you don't really need a ski jacket. And they couldn't buy ski jacket because there was a war time. I had trouble buying shoes, let alone ski jacket. So parents didn't know where the kids were, how they were doing. Kids didn't know where dad still uh, is alive or not, because bombing started to come. In the end, it was called the carpet bombing. I think they did that in Dresden and other parts of Europe, but they did it in Japan. My uncle, there, there was a, my father's side, we had an uncle. Um, he was my grandmother's favorite because he was disciplined, knew where he was going in his life. He became a high-ranking officer in Japanese military and honor of the family. But he was killed when the transport ship sank. And uh, Things got bad to us, I'll just make it very simple there. But I want you to know that my cousins had this separation, and the one of my, my uh, this uh, conductor uncle, his wife, which is my maternal aunt, although because of the stress, her resistance was very low, and she ended up she died of uh, encephalitis. And they had seven kids, and my cousin, who was only four years younger than me, so he was like maybe junior high school kid, he had to become head of the family in Hokkaido, while his father was, he's the conductor. And uh, he was, working for farmers, because this very liberal school he was attending had to be shut down. Um, the freedom of teaching the subject became very difficult. Anything that is Western is no good. You can't teach English because that's an enemy's language. So the family went through a very difficult time. And then, of course, finally, the bombing, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki came. By that time, Japan was so depleted, so exhausted. Everyone went home, went to bed hungry. They didn't know how much longer the ration the food is going to last to the next supply. And uh, people think I was affected by it physically, but no, I was not, fortunately, because I was about 500 miles away from Hiroshima, and the bombs they are making today would wipe out the whole country at the same one time, but at that time, Hiroshima bomb was somewhat contained within smaller radius, so... Um, I wasn't directly involved in that. In fact, I couldn't understand what it was about. The interesting thing is, this so-called God Emperor came to the, on the radio for the first time. Emperor doesn't, I mean, God does not speak through radio. <laughs> Unless 
you are really psychotic, and some people might think so. <laughs> so uh, Emperor came on the radio, and first thing he said was, I am no longer God, and said that Japan signed a treaty with the United States, unconditional surrender. So put down arms, end of the war. It took a few days to digest what that meant. To uh, make a long story short, we moved to a uh, city next to Kyoto. And housing shortage was tremendous because so many homes were burned during the bombing. So my parent bought one big house that was sort of like connected to a factory. Good thing they did because my uh, uncle, or actually my aunts, who were in Taiwan, remember the one that uh, we wrote the constitution to suit the Japanese colonialism? They got kicked out of Taiwan. <laughs> and had to come back to uh, Japan. They had, they had no place to go. They came with two suitcases. Guess what? My parents' home became a refugee camp. So um, that was connection is my father's oldest sister went to Taiwan when she married this lawyer, and uh, they lived very well. You can imagine, you know, attorney on a high-ranking position, they can have um, some maids and servant and have it pretty nice. Uh, actually, so that family came back. By that time, the man died, so it was just my aunt and their children. The another family, this military officer who was supposed to be so successful, who sank on the boat. So he and his, his family came. So I think we had about 10 people living in one house, one old-fashioned kitchen with one sink, two bathrooms. Oh, and I have this aunt who served in the imperial household. I think I told you that. He was a retirement age anyway, but anyhow, his jo her job was terminated. She lived very nicely inside the palace ground with the three maids had to come back. And she used to lecture us and sort of criticize my parents for not being able to manage money well. But give me a break, you know. He's a single woman with no children to pay for, and his, her room on the board was taken care of because she lived in an apartment inside the palace ground. And my father, he tried, but he has rented to pay with me and my brother. And of course, you know, they are little unorganized people, I must say, and I took after them. But anyway, <laughs> so they, my aunt used to criticize, how come they can't save money? They are wasting money, etc., etc. But you know what the joke was? Whole country was so poor, the bank could not give you a cash anymore. So they had so-called withdrawal moratorium. I never heard the English word moratorium until I saw it in katakana moratorium. Now what does that mean? That means you can cash your check or pull out of your saving account. Irony was my aunt was as broke as the rest of us. <laughs> Um, so if you can picture this uh, refugee camp-like housing situation with 
people coming from nice sunny Taiwan to call the city of Otsu, not as cold as Cleveland, but still it's pretty miserable when you don't have a central heating, which we did not have, nobody did. And my aunt from Imperial Palace, who didn't lift a finger to do anything because she had three very eager maids taking order without question. And my mother became a maid to her. Somebody has to. She had the best part of the house. She had her own bathroom. The rest of us had to go further into the colder part of the house to go to the bathroom, even if you were sick. So uh, we had some class struggle as well inside our own family. <laughs> um, I think I'll stop now. There is more story beyond that, but. Um, what do you think? Is this a good time for? Good time. Let's stop for about 10 minutes or so, get some refreshments, and then we'll question and answer as soon as that's over, okay? Let's break, please. Well, uh, you know, I kind of made a joke out of it, but it's really a serious story. 